Perhaps just as the, as the panel are assembling, has anybody got a question for Carol on that presentation? There's some amazing figures there. From an engineering perspective and certainly from a value perspective, that was, uh, that was uh, quite amazing. So, any questions? Okay, well, let's uh, move on to the panel discussion. Oh, sorry, sorry, I did see you at the back. Yes, sorry. Thank you. I just wondered if, uh, Carol, if there'd been any work into the impact of the, the slender towers on the urban heat island effect and the positive impact of that cap and trade system. Sorry, on, on the right. urban heat island effect in New York? The what? Heat island? I'm just... Urban heat island effect in New York from the... Urban heat island, is that what you're saying? Yes. I don't, I don't think that uh, these towers, I don't think it have much bearing on that, but um, uh, oh, in the Bloomberg administration, previous, the previous mayor, there was a lot of attention over long-term planning and sustainability, and um, there, uh, there's a huge program for addressing green roofs and whitewashing roofs and a whole series of other responses to, to that issue, which um, it, it, certainly um, is important in the, um, in the context of the, the tar paper beach is the way they used to describe rooftops in, um, in New York. I mean, and there, there's been a, a very concerted effort to respond to dealing with the specific heat island effect. But I don't think it has much bearing on, these, on the slenderness. Uh, if, if I could, uh, well, actually, uh, it has been shown that the slender towers are actually uh, quite a bit better uh, uh, than, than what you might call fatter towers from, the, from this point of view. And it's all about the amount of visibility you have to the sky compared to something which is stockier. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the, there is a evidence that suggests it could be better, uh, which is uh, you know, quite compelling. Good. Um, well, it's my pleasure to be a uh, uh, moderator for this uh, panel discussion. Uh, so, uh, uh, myself and the panelists are going to serenade you with some enlightening uh, discussion as you have your coffees and finish off your desserts. Apologies that we're running slightly late, but uh, we've got such an esteemed group of panelists here uh, and it's appropriate that we, we have a little bit of a discussion. I'm really keen to get your thoughts on a number of fronts. Um, and if I can just start the discussion by, you know, we've heard a lot about urbanization, the pressures on our cities and the like, uh, but I would like to hear your views maybe your individual views, as to, as to what the cities of 2050 should look like. Not necessarily a prediction as to what they will look like. I'd like to know what you would like them to look like, uh, uh, recognizing the challenges and the, and the constraints. Maybe I can start with James on that one. Oh, th thank you very much. Not a problem. Um, just a, an easy question. Uh, look, um, cities of the future, cities in, in 2050, well, I, I hope they're the cities that we want. That would be the first um, statement to make. I think sometimes we get um, bound up in, in process and regulation and sometimes don't get the outcomes that we necessarily seek to achieve. Um, but for me, I think they'll be about um, responding to issues of um, uh, the war on global talent, environmental sustainability, accessibility to global markets and a whole range of other things like that. Uh, and, and for me, I think to survive in that, in that competitive global market of cities, because they are a, um, uh, an important um, ecosystem in that way, it's about distinctiveness and amenity. And I think cities are increasingly understanding what it means to be authentic to themselves, and Brisbane's a good example of that, um, a maturing subtropical river city. Um, with access to Asia. Uh, and then secondly, amenity. I think if we're going to keep and hold the best people and actually create a value proposition in our cities, it needs to be driven by amenity, which is code for public realm, access to employment, and just great experiences. Yeah, no, fantastic. And Sandra, have you got uh, a reaction to that or your, sure. your own I, thoughts? I love future predictions. I'm still waiting for the hoverboard to come. You know? so <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite things is to read future predictions from 50 years ago, because they're a really good warning for us mm. about um, 
what we risk when we, when we make future predictions. It's very clear to me that the greatest density, the greatest rising density is occurring in shanty towns. So our biggest challenge is going to be how to deal with informal settlement. So I would like to see all, all the discussions that we've had today have been about visual amenity and really not enough about social amenity. So the city I would like to see is one which is able to bring on board and incorporate people who don't have money. Mm. And it's, it's going to be largely migrants. And the way we're going, it's going to be shanty towns mm. around luxury mm. if we don't um, deal with that very quickly. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. You know, there's a complete strata of people that need to be addressed. Uh, and particularly if, um, you know, the amount of people that we see, that we expect to uh, encroach into, into cities need to be accommodated. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of low-cost accommodation that needs to be needs to be found. I mean, do, do, do you think? Sorry, I don't mean to moderate. No, no, go, on, go on, James. Go for do, it. Do, do you think that um, this is all cyclical? Though, if you take a much more strategic view, I mean, one of the statistics that resonates with me that um, has come out of a piece of work we're doing currently is that Manhattan, um, and I'll get the the, the numbers roughly right. Um, I think in 1910 had an average population density of 1,500 people per hectare. Um, and that's actually less than half now um, over a 100-year period, which means actually density in true terms and height have almost no relationship. And that's borne out again by Shanghai, which has had a 300% increase in GFA in the last 20 years and a 20% reduction in urban density. So I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is that there are... The reverse can happen too, which is highly dense shanty environments potentially being transformed and then perhaps we'll, we'll go back the other way into the future. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, well, Carol... Uh, with the reference there to Manhattan. Uh, right. Um, well, that is, is true, actually. My husband uh, is at uh, a firm, New York University's firm and Institute for Real Estate and Urban Policy, and they just did a study on density. So I can report that um, the per, uh, per person density of living space is 600 square foot per person in New York, which uh, anybody who lives in here says, well, I don't have that much space. So somebody, it's, it's not shared equitably, but the point about density is there's built density and then there's occupied density. And um, I think that if we um, conceptualize density apropos to the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat as vertical density versus horizontal crowding that we can come up with a balance between concentrating people in a high-rise solution uh, and but yet keeping the ground plane open for uh, parks and amenities and using mass transit efficiently rather than individual um, cars. So it seems to me that uh, Council on tall buildings and urban habitat has within its uh, awkward name all of the, the ingredients by which these problems can be solved. I mean, the, the other interesting thing about... Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, the the, the, other, inter change, the other interesting thing about that is the way in which we, me we measure density. And I, I don't know if, if you're anything like me, you spend way more time in the office than you do at home. Um, and <laughs> uh, on that basis, we tend not to measure employment density in the same way we measure residential density and also the way we measure residential density in Australia, for example, in dwellings per hectare actually isn't that accurate um, uh, because it doesn't actually give you a sense of how many bedrooms are in that dwelling or what the actual carrying capacity is. So I think there's a lot of work to do to understand precisely what we mean by, mm. by density and actually what we're trying to say. Good. Um, can, can I add, oh, sorry, sorry uh, Sandra. Yeah. The, the other sorry, concern, Ahmed, I'll, I'll let Sandra go. The other concern <laughs> for me is the countryside because we're presuming growth in the cities and most of that growth in particularly Asia is coming from people leaving the countryside behind. So when we visualise the city as this magnificent, diverse, fantastic place, we have to ask where the food is coming from, where the water is coming from and what is out there in the rural areas anymore. Where is manufacturing happening? Where is... Where is farming coming yeah. from? Yeah, very good point, very good point. Before Ahmad uh, gives us his view, I will be at the end of Ahmad's uh, response be asking uh, one of the younger members of the audience here to give us their views about what they would like to see in 2050. So start thinking about it. Ahmad. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, if you look around what's going on uh, since uh, historically in terms of where we were 100 years ago, where we are today, and where we will be in 10 years or 15 years. I think connectivity is one of the key uh, points that we need to uh, look at. The second one is 
the prediction in 2050, uh, you most likely would have more than 60% of the human population will be concentrated in cities. Yes. Which means where we need to focus uh, on is how do we make cities more efficient? How do we uh, make the living conditions um, you know, more affordable, as we said to everyone? And, uh, and at the same time, um, uh, we have to keep the city open. Yes. Uh, public parks, we have to have people to have equal time to enjoy the nature. I mean, we cannot just build cities like, for example, New York, I like it, yeah. but at the same time, being there and walking around the city, there are nice parts, but there are also parts that are not so nice. Um, the question is, and, and going up is uh, higher, uh, you know, taller and taller, I think it is the way to open the space, as you can see from uh, in, in what happened uh, in Dubai. For example, there are a lot of cities that we are not watching out for is where um, they are in a very, very, very harsh environment. Yeah. And uh, these cities cannot be sustained either economically or in the future to maintain them. Yeah. So I think having a denser city, it allows you um, more freedom to, um, to manage the city better in terms of transportation, in terms of security, in terms of um, the culture of, of living there. I think just being able just to walk to places rather than having uh, long distances. And I, I think uh, going up high and gaining air right, whether it's horizontally instead of a single layer, multiple layer, we started to see that connectivity between buildings and creating another level of culture. I mean, these things, I think, uh, it's going to happen. The second one is uh, uh, in terms of uh, the IT technologies that we see and in the future, how we operate cities, you know, how we manage cities, uh, how do we ensure the security of cities. Uh, right now, it's just not fully um, uh, utilized, mm -hmm. I think. We have the technology, but uh, we have a long way to well, go. I think, I think you've touched so, on something that's, that's yeah. very important to everybody, and you see the influx of people into cities. Uh, and it's safety. Safety in cities is, is paramount. Uh, and, you know, that's got to be a key, key consideration For in For example, you walk into Seoul and 20 million people. Uh, I don't mind if my son goes when he was 14 anywhere in the city. Uh, you go to New York, Chicago, you can't even leave your house open, you know, because somebody you are afraid of. So having a security system, uh, knowing that everybody is being watched somewhere, there is a watchful eye. Uh, can have a major impact and change of the behavior of the people. Okay. And that is something that uh, right now is not uh, yet fully total. And it's just, if somebody does something wrong, he knows he's going to be caught. Yeah. You know, and then uh, this is a security for people that is very important, I think. Okay. Yeah. Can I just ask, uh, and uh, I don't know if, um, if somebody would like to give us their thoughts about what city should be like in 2050. I laid down the gauntlet to some of our younger people um, uh, in the audience. Does anybody want to uh, respond? Yes. Well done, that man. <laughs> well, just, just, a, just a moment. We'll... Um, hi, my name's Annie. Um, you guys spoke about um, farming being an important issue in the future. Have you guys thought about you know, integrating vertical farming into new cities in the future? Um, uh, very good question, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I mean, with many, many uh, uh, developments, new developments, ideal, you know, idealized developments, we are seeing, uh, you know, the, the desire to integrate uh, vertical farming uh, uh, into, into some of those inner city projects. Uh, I'm not sure how many of them are actually uh, up and running. I mean, uh, maybe I could ask Sandra. Uh, <laughs> <There's> <laughs> a, sorry about that, Sandra. Yeah. Uh, but no, in terms of uh, you know the, the university and whether that's a part of the, should we say, the, the, the sort of um, uh, uh, research or uh, initiatives that you might be looking at for the future. Not currently looking at vertical mm -hmm. vertical farming my, myself, um, and I'm not sure who mm -hmm. is. I think probably in the Sustainable Futures Institute they might maybe. they might be. Um, but the farming issue is a really kind of problematic area because you know growing lettuces in your in your window box is actually not going to feed you. If anyone's ever tried to be 
self-sufficient, it's really bloody hard work and, you know, you spend the whole time fighting insects and then giving up your sustainable principles and spraying everything. So I, th I think some of the most interesting areas are in, in using buildings productively is around algae and biofuels, you know, there, there's a huge amount of research in that area and I can see that integrating with architecture very, very soon. There's already some very good work so around as algae a, as production. So as a fuel rather than a food? Uh, and as, and a, as a absorber of carbon dioxide. So there, yeah. you know, there's, so, there's various kind of algae. So I can see James getting It's an interesting uh, getting thing. Into I, I actually was um, tried to figure out why Australia has a quarter acre block and this whole kind of historic topology. Mm. And it was actually mandated when the penal colony in Sydney was settled as the area of land that was calculated to be sufficient to feed a family mm. on its own. I don't know whether that's scientific or not, probably isn't, but if you use that logic and carry it through, it's not possible mm. to feed civilization in elevated urban farms, and I dare say it's probably not economic. Yes. Um, and although it's a terrific idea, I was, I was in, um, practiced um, well, I suppose I still do practice, but I was part of a, the, um, the, you know, the community garden craze in the 90s. And the first thing to get demolished in every project or overgrown with weeds is the opportunity you give people to grow things. They actually don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Ahmed, from your think, experience um, in Seoul and uh, other parts uh, of the world. First of all, I think uh, the practicality of the situation and what does that mean? For every building we build, we try to get away from water, we get away from wetness. <laughs> Because that by itself, actually, it's a source of problem. Um, so the second one is the practicality, and when you have billions of people, I mean, it's very difficult to imagine uh, what you really can produce. Um, so in the nutshell, I think in the long run, uh, urbanization is uh, the key, uh, which means that uh, you open uh, where people are in the land, out there and just use those as natural source or where you grow and, and feed uh, the nations. I think this is, uh, it cannot change. I think obviously, um, you know, land is created to be horizontal, you know, for farming, for plantation, for everything. Uh, what you can do there, you cannot do vertically. I think we just, uh, it's a great idea from time to time, but I'm not sure about the viability uh, long term of that kind so, of options. Carol, with, uh, from your experience, is there anything that uh, has, 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 has it, uh, been contemplated in, in New York by any chance? Vertical farming? Mm. Yes, there's a professor at Columbia. Uh, I'm a professor at Columbia, and um, I find it embarrassing uh, that, uh, that, this is, that his proposal has gotten as far as it has, because I agree with Ahmed that, um, that the ground plane is the right place for plants uh, and that, that whether it's embodied energy or any other issue about putting lettuce and tomatoes um, 20 stories or higher in the air is, is um, a fairly ridiculous notion. Yeah, $6,000 a square foot, you've got to produce a lot of vegetables. <laughs> uh, that, that I do know, that I do know. The other dimension to that, though, is, is the ecosystem benefit, which is a different discussion, yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, but um, green walls and green roofs, mm. uh, as they insulate against uh, thermal gain, um, are all very important parts. And nature in the city is uh, is something that well, we should well, all that's consider. Some, that, that's yeah. something that I, I, you know, I would like uh, the panel's views on. We are seeing uh, a wave of uh, green buildings. That's buildings that uh, you know have got vegetation on the on the outside. Uh, and there's one uh, in um, uh, uh, in Sydney, Bond Central Park, which is actually an award-winning building. <laughs> Um, and that's received a lot of praise. We are seeing a number of those buildings around the world which, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, look green. Uh, uh, is this something that you see as a, a continuing trend or is it a little bit of a, bit of a whim? Is everyone looking at me because I keep talking? Yeah. Uh, so, um, Richard Hassel from WOHA in Singapore was out here recently, courtesy of Architectus, I think. Yes. Um, and he was quite, did a quite fascinating presentation. And I mean, really, you could probably argue that Singapore's the home or at least the, the, the avant garde in relation to that. And that the land economics and presumably the governance issues attached to that context are entirely different to what we have in, in Australia. Um, and so I think it's a noble endeavour and I support it entirely for the amenity benefits that it brings, but I think it's a slightly more complex thing potentially right. here. Um, than in other places. I think uh, the other thing that you don't see very often, which I think it's uh, uh, absolutely is necessary. Why is there is only one park in New York where everybody has this? If you look around uh, Seoul, there is a green belt, 
what they call it, where nothing, uh, people can build nothing on it. It's mountains, it's hikes, it's parks. So everybody in the city can have access to go up on a mountain walk if he, they want in the morning. Uh, building more parks, uh, that's the reason why going vertical is very important. So um, I think uh, these are the kind of things that are required by uh, city planners. Where do you uh, create uh, areas where accessible to everyone, where they can enjoy things. And that is something important, not to just build the whole city, uh, street after street. Good. Thank you. And you can tell um, that will come. Well, New York does have a lot of parks, as a matter of fact. And, and um, a part of the presentation that I didn't get to, um, uh, even with speaking too long, was um, to, uh, to mention the implications of public policy and, and shadows on parks, because um, you, you were referring, Ahmed, to Central Park, and it's not our only park, but it seems to be the only park that the New York Times cares about. Because if you're going to apply the principle to public policy that you can't put shadow on a park or a playground or anything else that's logical, then you have to think of the, the complementary constraints that you're putting on affordable, uh, affordability of housing, um, increased density. So that's why I find that particularly specious the argument that's brought forth about slender towers um, at forming a kind of picket fence or a, a continuous shadow on the park. Because all parks are important, all, all, all sunlight is important equally, so why do we privilege only Central Park? So I think it's a very, very complicated issue, which is why I would call for a much more nuanced and sophisticated modeling of how shadows actually do affect parks in time, over time, rather than these kind of histrionic images of long, long cast shadows occluding any kind of sunlight. Which, which does require a lot of investment from the government. For example, uh, I've been living in Seoul for about 12 years. And in the 12 years period, uh, I tell you the amount of investment that the government has made to improve the living conditions in the city, I've never seen in any, actually, country. Uh, the entire uh, river front almost upgraded and it become a park. So anybody can, in a matter of a walk, can take a bike ride, can run, can... So the whole city, and, and surprisingly, it was done by farmers in the winter time. They come, they don't have anything to do, so practically, actually, they build the entire... More than uh, farming. <laughs> no, and in, fact, in fact, believe it or not, mm. uh, they do have uh, areas where if somebody wants to plant, mm. they can rent a small area and they farm. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Could I, could yeah. I just say it? You can one more on. answer. Please I mean, do. What, what they would say one of my takeaways from the morning and the relationship of the morning to the um, lack of relationship to the to the New York example um, is that in in New York, where you always have to ask the question, who owns the land, who buys the land, who, de who develops the land? And in New York, we have developed since the 1960s in particular, but especially in the 1980s, the public-private partnership that makes that press it that pushes the um, the responsibility for development onto the onto private developers right in a public in a in, whether in a partnership or a mitigation so when you say well the government of Seoul builds parks we don't have any park we we have parks and we can't support them because people vote against the taxes um, that, to pay in order to support that kind of public service so we're in a completely different situation um, and I, I think it's interesting to note from the developers' pre presentations about the respective cities um, this morning that, um, that, that there have to be mechanisms in order to make the um, complementary ends of private development and public good come into some sort of balance, whether that's political from the government itself in a planning review process or a participatory democracy response or, um, or, or you know, uh, philosopher king or whatever it is, um, governments have um, um, conflicting can, can I ask a question motives. Carol? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I'm going to have to cut oh. you short there, Sandra. <laughs> oh, uh, I know we could. Uh, I'll um, ask her out. It's always the fear when you put a, a, a panel of enthused, uh, <laughs> uh, enlightened people together. We could talk all day, uh, but uh, I am getting all sorts of warnings about uh, uh, time. So, look, uh, thank you very, very much for that uh, engaging discussion.
uh, at that juncture, I'd like to bring the panel discussion to a close. Uh, and if I could call upon David Eden to come forward and give the vote of thanks, please. I'll just speak on behalf of David. Um, my name's Jeremy Skews. I'm from Brookfield Multiplex. I think um, today was a fantastic event and um, very, very interesting. I, I've actually recently returned from the Middle East um, and I spent um, a couple of years sitting inside a dusty side office and looked at um, Ahmed's fine work um, rising itself out from the ground over a number of years. Um, we, we were actually involved in building the raft slab for, <coughs> for the project. Um, earlier than that, uh, we were involved in Dubai's previous tallest towers, which were the Emirates Towers. Um, we we uh, built one tower. Samsung were building the one next to us. It was a bit of a race, and we won. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I think ours was bigger than yours as well. <laughs> <laughs> but yours is bigger than everyone's now. So. So, on behalf of Brookfield Multiplex, I'd like to thank everyone who's attended today, all of our guest speakers. Um, if uh, you'd like to join me for a, a round of applause, thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know we're over time. I have 10 takeaways for you, as if you haven't heard enough verbiage already. Number one, politics. There's no politicians here today. That's because height and density is a really sensitive issue here in Brisbane at the moment, and aren't they brave? Well done. But most of what everyone in this room does day in, day out is about politics, so uh, we just need to take that on board. Uh, secondly, demand. Uh, we really need to be careful about where we get our statistics about demand from. Uh, some of it is self-serving in this city and some of it is overly negative, but it's always good to get another type of opinion about that. Third thing is, I think we need to build expectations in our community about the future that they deserve to have. Um, we need to articulate the benefits of height and the urban design outcomes on the ground plane. Some of our speakers today use the phrase, architecture as art. One, two, three, four, five. It's important for us to link infrastructure projects to city building growth, um, rather than just sorting out congestion that should have been sorted out a few decades ago. Renters of small apartments actually bring a lot of dynamism to their localities and a lot of money into their coffee shops. Uh, Ahmed has very eloquently, I think, with the most biggest, fattest array of confusing slides I've ever seen, but I'm just a town planner. Uh, but design for efficiency is very important. Um, new, new, new buildings um, need less and smaller materials in order to be bigger and taller. Um, that way we can have more technology in them and more mechanical devices and machines that make them work. Uh, Carol, thank you very much. I now have a lovely phrase to talk to my wife about the super slender ultra luxury tower, which I don't think I'll ever be able to afford. Um, I, I, I don't know whether I look forward to the day when Brisbane has $100 million penthouses um, uh, or duplexes that high. Um, the slenderness ratios, which is another good thing. I'm sure we can write some rules about that as a town planner. 1 to 12 to 1 to 20. And we use a ruler to explain it. Perfect for politicians. <laughs> Panoramic views, transferable development rights, um, and switchback stairs, which gets you 15-foot ceilings. Not good design after all, just good escape routes. Um, and slender shadows, which form sundials across your favourite park. It's all there for the future for us. Um, David Waldron, um, for your son, um, if, and, like, and uh, my, my kids are the same. If our kids have given up on owning a home, um, then maybe we should offer them better and more relevant options in the future. Um, and maybe part of that is looking at new versions of the granny flat. No, 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 no. Ten, cities for the future. Distinctiveness and amenity. Density and height seem to have no relationship. Lovely phrase from Carol, I think, about vertical density versus horizontal crowding. Um, how do we have cities that hold and keep the best people? 
Um, and then the next, in the next breath, we were talking about how we deal with the social amenity of shanty towns. So I'm not quite sure which part of the city the best people uh, live in. Um, more efficiency, more amenity, more security, especially for cities that are completely different to Brisbane and that they live in harsh environments. Uh, final observation from me, um, I recently sold my house, so I've been looking around here in Brisbane for somewhere to live, and I can tell you that the cost of apartments overlooking the Brisbane River within Cooey of the CBD has not increased in price for over a decade. Think about that one. I'd like to thank, on behalf of the BDA and the organisers, I'd like to thank our platinum uh, sponsor, Brookfield Multiplex, our gold sponsor, ISPT, our silver sponsors, Arup, Conrad Gargett, the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Queensland, and I'd particularly like to extend some thanks to Renee Peters, Je Jessica Shannon, and all the other people on the organising committee. For those people, our sponsors, and these lovely people up in front of you, a big rousing round of applause, please. <laughs> So I'm sorry, there ain't no more. Go and do some work, make a living, and buy a big apartment at the top of a building. Thank you.